Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we build on last week's examination of the Hanford site in southeastern Washington state with a look at the recent radiation spike recorded by EPA in nearby Richland. It's been attributed to Hanford, but is that the actual source? Radcast Mimi German has a compelling interpretation of the data and comes to another conclusion. Walk with her through the logic that contradicts the widely accepted echo chamber talking points in today's interview. Plus, our ever-popular Numbnuts of the Week feature, Nuclear Reactor Duck, and Cover Report, and more honest nuclear information than lying so-called journalists in Nevada at the Democratic Caucus can shake a chair at. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, May 24, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Starting in the U.S., where thousands of homeowners who lived downwind of the former Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant in Colorado and the operators of the controversial facility have settled a lawsuit to the tune of $375 million, more than a quarter of a century after the legal action was first filed. The settlement, which must be approved by a federal judge, brings to an end a 26-year legal saga that began when homeowners living east of Rocky Flats accused the plant's operators, Rockwell International Corporation and Dow Chemical Company, of devaluing their properties due to plutonium releases from the plant. The lawsuit, which includes as many as 15,000 homeowners, was first filed in 1990 and applies only to those who, as of June 7 of 1989, the day after the FBI raided Rocky Flats, those people owned property in the affected area. Anyone who sold their property before that date or purchased property after that date would not qualify. A spokesmodel for Dow Chemical said her company's share of the settlement total is $131.25 million, but... The U.S. Department of Energy, which oversaw the plant, ultimately is expected to pay the bill. That's what she said, meaning that's us. Let's hear it for taxpayer dollars, bailing out the nuclear industry yet again. As for that $375 million settlement, it sounds like a lot, but here's a warning shot from Patty Amino, who waged a similar battle to have a cleanup done of the Numec nuclear facility in Apollo, Pennsylvania, and just succeeded. She wrote, looks like 27 years is the norm for fighting the nuclear industry and the government. Years ago, a jury had awarded the plaintiffs in their case against the defendants, the Rocky Flat contractors, Rockwell and Dow, $532 million, but the defendants appealed that award. Please note that the current Rocky Flat settlement of $375 million is for at least 15,000 claimants, is only for property, and with the standard plaintiff's attorney's fees of 40% plus cost, that would probably be in the neighborhood of 10 to 20%. Considering the 27 years of case litigation and appeals span, the end result for each of the 15,000 plaintiffs will probably only be around $12,000. It may be a win, but it is the very definition of a Pyrrhic victory. Look it up. Meanwhile, the Rocky Flats Downwinders launched their health survey on March 17, last Tuesday, for people who reside downwind of Rocky Flats and may have health problems due to exposure to plutonium and other toxins released from the facility there. We'll have a link up to Rocky Flats Downwinders on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 257. In Illinois, Nuclear Energy Information Service of Chicago testified before the Illinois State Senate Energy and Public Utilities Committee that the new Exelon legislation amounted to a corporate welfare bailout 
designed to kill renewable energy and transfer wealth from Illinois ratepayers to Exelon shareholders. In other words, business as usual for the nuke industry. NEIS Director David Kraft urged legislators to reject the flawed Exelon legislation, the so-called Next Generation Energy Plan. Their PR trolls worked overtime on that one. And asked them to fix the Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard as soon as possible and before considering any Exelon reactor bailout schemes. Kraft said, Exelon's obstructionism has done real harm to Illinois renewable energy. Exelon now suggests that it will continue to do that harm unless its failed and anachronistic business model is rewarded, bailed out. It is simply inappropriate and irresponsible and dumb energy policy to reward such self-fulfilling prophecy. A Sanders water advocate has testified in a New York State nuclear hearing. No, not Bernie Sanders. Sanders, Arizona whose water supply has been contaminated with uranium. Northern Arizona University graduate student Tommy Rock helped discover the problem and show that state officials knew about it for more than 10 years and did nothing. On May 17, Rock was invited to speak in New York in front of the New York State Public Commission about the dangers of uranium mining. He was called to testify because New York nuclear facilities operate on uranium imported from the Southwest, including places similar to Sanders, where the water issues have been brought to light. Tommy Rock made the point that while New York may benefit from using uranium, which considering Indian Point is open to debate, the places the uranium is collected from may see serious adverse effects. He was invited to speak because of the current proposal called the Clean Energy Fund, which aims to make New York State operate on 50% renewable energy by 2030, but would bail out several poorly profiting nuclear sites, which would mean more mining to keep those sites operational. Nuclear reactor duck! <laughs> and cover report. The emergency siren system sounded at First Energy's Beaver Valley Nuclear Power Station in Shippingport, Pennsylvania, 25 miles northwest of Pittsburgh. This on Friday, May 20th. The system sounded for about three to four minutes, but not the 15 minutes it would during a routine drill. And it did not sound at the power plant, but rather in either Beaver County or nearby Hancock County, West Virginia, or Columbiana County, Ohio, which are within 10 miles of the shipping port facility. Talk about your adrenal rush. This is the exact same thing that happened at both Braidwood and Dresden in Illinois on May 9. Guys, get your emergency notification system fixed. <laughs> At Watts Bar 1 in Tennessee on May 17, a bus, B-U-S-S, de-energized, resulting in a loss of voltage on the bus. No, not a kiss, but a metal strip that conducts electricity. Only this metal strip didn't. In response to the loss of power, the operators entered abnormal operating instructions and started emergency diesel generators. <laughs> And Watts Bar 2 became America's first new nuclear reactor in 20 years. New being a relative term because it took 44 years to build this sucker. Longer than the 40-year license period. And easily the technology is a good 50 years old. It was an antique before it ever started on Monday morning, May 23rd. And while this white elephant was projected to cost $2.2 billion, costs increased to $4.7 billion. Rev up the rad monitors and keep your fingers crossed. And that's this week's Nuclear Reactor Duck <laughs> and Cover Report. And now... Nuclear Hot Seed, Nuclear Hot Seed, Nuclear Hot Seed, None that's on a week. The blatantly pro-nuclear American Nuclear Society, Nuclear Energy Institute, 
think tank The Third Way and U.S. Nuclear Infrastructure Council expressed their deep concern over what they called informed reports that the White House is contemplating eliminating the position of nuclear energy policies are from the National Security Council. We have a nuclear energy policy czar. Why has no one ever told me about this? The man who currently holds the position is Michael Wallet, And according to these four pro-nukester groups, the position he holds is, in their words, essential to ensure intra-agency coordination on cross-cutting issues between the departments of commerce, state, energy, treasury, the U.S. Trade Representative, and the Export-Import Bank. Note that there's nothing there about health, about safety, about people and the environment. And why does this have to be a czar? An antiquated term used for despotic Russian rulers. And if we have to have a czar, where's our sustainability czar? The peace czar. Even if peace czar is a contradiction in terms. Just another level of bureaucratic, nuclear, nonsense, garbanzo beans, and fecal matter. So if this guy, Michael Watlett, is at some kind of crossroads for nuclear decision-making, how do we get to him? Where is he? Who is he? And could we possibly convince the current administration to get rid of that position? And who bosses the boss of the nuclear bosses? Too confusing. Too distant. Too hard to get to. And that's why Office of Nuclear Energy Policies are. That is what is this week's Nuclear Hot Seed. None nuts of the week. The U.S.-Japan connection here. Former Japanese Prime Minister Junichiro Koizume made an emotional plea for support of U.S. Navy sailors beset by health problems that resulted from radioactive fallout after the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster. More than 400 veterans who were part of a mission called Operation Tomodachi to provide humanitarian relief after the earthquake and tsunami that started the Fukushima nuclear disaster more than five years ago filed a lawsuit in California against Tokyo Electric Power Company, a story we've covered regularly here on Nuclear Hot Seat. Koizumi, 74, responded to a request from a group supporting the plaintiffs and flew to the United States to meet with 10 veterans. At a news conference on May 17, Koizumi said, U.S. military personnel who did their utmost in providing relief are now suffering from serious illnesses. We cannot ignore the situations. Proponents and opponents of nuclear energy must think together about what can be done. According to Stars and Stripes magazine, 16 U.S. ships that aided in this rescue operation, known as Operation Tomodachi, are still contaminated with radiation, including the USS Reagan, which is now homeported in Yokosuka, with a full contingent of 5,000 sailors on board. While naval and governmental officials try to fob off the remaining radiation as not important or impactful on health, Nuclear Hot Seat has learned from pipe fitters who worked on this job that there is no way to completely decontaminate the ship and that those who found high levels of radiation and sanded, primed, and painted those areas said they were given little or no protective gear, a claim that the Navy denies. Of course. More than 70 prominent scholars and activists, including Oliver Stone, Noam Chomsky, and Daniel Ellsberg, signed a letter urging President Obama to visit with Hibakusha, atomic bomb survivors, and to announce concrete steps towards nuclear disarmament when he visits Hiroshima this Friday. Meanwhile, TEPCO will suspend most work at Fukushima for three days starting tomorrow, Wednesday, as Japan hosts the Group of Seven Summit this week. The company will halt the construction of tanks for storing radioactive water and preparations for removing nuclear fuel from the number three reactor pool out of a sense of caution. What, world leaders get precautions, but not your own people? We'll have today's featured interview in just a moment. But first, as we head towards the five-year anniversary of Nuclear Hot Seat, we continue to rely on you, the listeners, to help meet our expenses. No amount is too small 
or too large. But if you're on a budget like me, consider giving what I like to call a Starbucks donation, the equivalent of what you'd pay for a cup of coffee with maybe a little bit of a nosh on the side. It's a great way to get started helping the show. You can also make this kind of donation recurring, buying the equivalent of a cup of coffee a month to help support honest, verifiable news and information about nuclear issues. So let's raise an imaginary cup to get our coffee fix on and toast to Nuclear Hot Seat. You can do so by going to NuclearHotSeat.com, click on the big red donate button, and know that whatever amount you can offer, it's energy, it's intention, it's support, it's love. And I am really grateful to you for whatever you can offer. Last week on Nuclear Hot Seat number 256, we focused on the Hanford site in southeastern Washington state, which is the most radioactively contaminated area in America and one of the most polluted places on Earth. In early May, a radiation spike recorded by EPA monitors in nearby Richland, Washington, was attributed to the ongoing leak of a storage tank at Hanford. But was that the actual source of the spike? Today's guest provides a persuasive argument and evidence that perhaps the source of that radiation was different, and if possible, even more dangerous. Mimi German is the founder of RADCAST, which focuses on interpreting radiation data. The group helps citizen activists learn how to take accurate radiation readings, which RADCAST then compiles to figure out what's going on, radiologically speaking, wherever the EPA has fallen down on the job, which is just about everywhere. Mimi also explains the exact working process she and the others at RADCAST go through with available data to try and nail down the truth of what's happening at our nuclear facilities. Her unsettling discovery about the recent radiation spike, and actually that's plural, spikes, attributed to Hanford, is a real eye-opener. We spoke on Monday, May 23rd, 2016. Give a listen. Mimi Gurman, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thanks for having me back. There's a lot going on. I understand. First of all, give us some background on the Columbia Generating Station, what it is, where it is, and what we need to know about it to get a clear bead on what we'll be talking about. The Columbia Generating Station is one of the worst running nuclear power plants in the United States. It's located on Hanford's property. Though it's not a nuke dump, it is a nuclear power plant. And it's important to understand the difference between Hanford and the Columbia Generating Station before we even move further into this interview. Hanford, again, is a nuclear dump that has been receiving $2 billion a year for decades to clean up the mess that was left by the Manhattan Project. That's not happening. The mess is still there. $2 billion is continuing to come in every year for whoever is in charge. For the last few years, the last bunch of years, it's been Bechtel. The Columbia Generating Station is run by a group of people across Washington under the name of Energy Northwest. We are working right now at trying to shut down the Columbia Generating Station. And we have um, a couple of initiatives that just came out for the state of Washington. You can find the initiatives and read about them on radcast.org. There's a page on there, the Washington Initiatives. You can just pull that up whenever you'd like and download those initiatives and start collecting signatures for us if you are in Washington. The importance of shutting down CGS is multifold. One is that nuclear power plants generate nuclear waste, and we have no place to put that waste. That's one. There are equal reasons, and many of them, to understand when talking about nuclear power plants. Nuclear power plants fail. They fail like they failed at Fukushima. The Columbia Generating Station is built like the nuclear power plant at Fukushima, and it's situated on the Columbia River in Washington State. Hanford has been leaking into the Columbia River for decades. 
We don't want the waste from CGS getting into the river as well. We don't want fires coming into the Hanford region. We don't want fires at CGS. We don't want the grid to go down, which would involve CGS going down. The grid going down would create many, many catastrophic problems for the region. So again, Hanford is a nuke dump. The Columbia Generating Station is a nuclear power plant, which needs to be closed down immediately. And we're working on that through Nonix Northwest. That's a great grounding, Mimi. Now, a recent radiation spike was recorded by the Environmental Protection Agency on May 5th. How has it been framed in the media and by the EPA? And what is your take on the source of that leak? Well, it's important to understand that the EPA never frames anything in truth, regardless of anything that occurs at either Hanford or a nuclear power plant. We look at the EPA for their graphs because they have monitoring stations across the United States. It's the only source we have where we get large amounts of radioactive readings through their monitoring system that we can analyze. The way that we analyze those is by comparing the graphs that we see on the EPA site with the NRC event pages. Has there been an event at a nuclear power plant near the monitoring station from the EPA graph? That's first. We also have to look at the NRC Adams page in order to find out what else might be going wrong at a nuclear power plant. We study these against each other to see if there's any relevant data which coincides with a rise or a spike on an EPA graph. I do not believe that any of this was done when that particular spike that you're referring to came out. We have many graphs during the same time frame that came out in those two months to three months that made me look instead of at what is happening at the Y102 leaking tank at Hanford, it made me turn my vision over to what's going on at CGS. And so I did. This particular spike has been generally attributed to the underground leaks of the old radioactive waste at Hanford. But you're saying that that may not be the case. That is what I'm saying. And in fact, it's probably not the case. The leak at Y102 has been going on for at least four years. And Susanna Frame has been covering this for a long time. And if you Google Y102, you'll also see lots of different articles over the last few years on sickness from workers at Hanford. This is not the first time this has happened. I've spoken with Annette Carey, who is one of the leading journalists from Tri-City Herald about this. And she's told me that this has been going on for a while. People have been getting sick there for years due to the same issues, but nobody has brought the issues to light. So the issues at Hanford are very important and they're very dangerous. And I have to stress that I am aware of that first and foremost. At the same time, you have to look at the situation, what's been happening there. What's been happening is this tank has been leaking for a long time. They've been trying to move the radiate the waste into a different containment vessel where, sure, we can get leaks. Is this the leak? Meaning the leak that led to the May 5th spike that EPA recorded. That's right. And I'm going to show you how I've countered that information, that I believe that that spike is coming from the Columbia Generating Station. That magnitude of the spike we haven't mentioned yet, meaning the size of it compared to what's usually recorded. That spike, it's 410 counts per minute, 410. Versus what's normal there? What's normal there is around 180, 190 Which is high anyway. Minute. Well, no. The EPA monitors receive much more radiation hits than our little Geiger counters do. So we can't compare EPA monitors to a Geiger counter because it's just, it's a whole different range. It would be like you being able to have a vision of a full sky because you were in Ontario and there weren't big buildings. Or you're having a vision of the sky from New York City and that level of the sky is much smaller because the buildings are there. We can only receive a smaller amount of radiation from our Geiger counters. So what's normal there is, as far as EPA goes, it is around 180. So this is a lot higher. 410 is a lot higher. It's a big spike. Regarding spikes, we would not see one spike from fumes coming from Y102. We would see a constant level of higher readings, which we have not. 
That's not to say that the tank isn't fuming or gassing off. It is. But we haven't seen elevated levels from something as constant as this leak with only one spike. It's just not something I would believe would happen after watching many new plants leak. We see these EPA graphs differently when we're watching new plants leak, including what happens when we watched Fukushima radiation hitting us over the years on the West Coast. The elevated readings that we received from Fukushima, which is what I and many others believe we were getting, were elevated for a large period of time. There was a time in 2014 where the elevated levels lasted for over three months and then dropped down to what had been our quote-unquote normal background. How do I know? Because others were having similar readings regarding elevated levels at the same time. One spike is never something that we depend on for knowledge. It could be a gamma ray from the sun, and it really could be. We don't know, which is why we don't go from one spike. It doesn't tell us anything except what a particular spike was. It is patterns that we look for, and we look to substantiate why the patterns are happening. There were no patterns on the EPA graphs around the time of what was going on with this leak and the 410 counts per minute spike. We could see from Fukushima major steam events and sometimes even TEPCO would report problems, though rarely, which enforced the data that was coming in, was coming in from steam events, it showed up on our Geiger counters, and there was our pattern. Radiation is invisible. It's difficult to understand. The ways we were given to understand what we see are through these graphs, through charts, event sources such as the NRC pages and sometimes reports from nuke plants themselves. And that's what I went to. I went to all of these sources to figure out if this spike was from Hanford. Why? Because I like to know these things. And you also live not that far away. I live 177 miles downstream. So it's possible to track sources. This is not an impossible task. I do this and a few others of us do this. So in tracking the source, I came up with a different assertion. And your assertion about the truth of where this spike came from is? I think that the spike began, not the actual spike, but what caused this spike is also what caused numerous other spikes. And we have to turn back the time to March 27th, 2016. If you look at the EPA graphs from March 27th into May, and I'm going to break this down for you on an almost daily basis, we can see that things were starting to happen not only on the EPA graphs, but I'll bring in how the Columbia Generating Station fits in. On March 27th, we began to see a radiation hike from the normal background, which was about 180 counts per minute there, to 220. On March 29th, it went from 220 to 280. On March 31st, just a couple days later, it went from 280 to 310. April 1st into April 2nd, it went from 310 to 350. The base now was no longer 180. The background base went from 180 to 220. So everything is elevating now and it's staying higher. The radiation releases continue to skyrocket on April 7th. They went from 270 to on April 14th, 410. And April 21st from 410 to 440. By April 22nd, they started to subside again to backgrounds all the way back to 190, which is where we began before March 27th. So what was going on at CGS? The EPA shut off the monitor from April 26th to May 4th. What happened between April 26th to May 4th? On May 5th, There was a big spike, which hit 440 counts per minute. And that's when EPA turned the monitors back on, though we have no idea what happened in the approximately week before that. Exactly. It was one day after they turned on the monitor that that spike hit. 
between May 10th and May 16th, there were also spikes reaching close to 300, which were a little bit lower, but still high for the area. Now, here's where it gets interesting. At the same time, on May 9th, the Columbia Generating Station powered down from 100% to 87%. Why? The why is really important. It's also really important to understand that by the time they power down and decide to power down, an event has already been occurring. And you have human beings deciding what to do, what is the problem that they're seeing that we do not see because they're not telling us that made them power down on May 9th. When there is a reason for a nuclear power plant to power down, it's often or probable anyway that there is a leak inside the plant or something has been happening at the plant or there could be a leak. We don't know. We have to look at the events. So on May 9th, 2016, the Columbia Generating Station powers down to 87%. Then they went back up to 100%. On the same day? Uh, I think it was the next day. Just a week later, on May 15th, the Columbia Generating Station powers down again from 100% to 85%. Hey, folks, something is going wrong at the Columbia Generating Station, making the plant power down not once, but twice in one week. What happened before they powered down? Again, back to that question, which is the most important question. How long before they powered down was something going wrong inside that plant? And what was it? We don't know. I believe that the problem was there was some form of a leak, some form of instability going on with fission where CGS decided it needed to replace a control rod Control rods are the thing which creates stabilization inside a nuclear power plant. Why do you need a, a different control rod? Because things aren't stable. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Excuse me. I had to make a noise there. Go ahead. Now, we have the date so far. Just in, in recapping, that's May 9th, May 15th, and let's bring it to May 23rd. They powered down again. From 100% to 93%. This is freak out stuff. Now here is the most interesting part. All of that happened in May. The power down and power up. Let's go back to March 20th. It turned out that it was on March 20th that there was a need for a control rod change. All the way back to March 20th. And they needed the control rod change so that a leak wouldn't continue to grow within the nuclear power plant in a fuel rod. Now, is this information that is known to you hardcore? Is this supposition? Is this deduction? How did you come to this understanding or this belief about the situation at CGS? I knew that something had to be going on because a spike doesn't just come out of nowhere. It usually has other spikes with it. And so the first question I had was, are there other spikes in this time frame? And I, of course, went directly to the Columbia Generating Station to see if I could piece this together. Just this morning, I spoke to the NRC person who is in charge of the Columbia Generating Station. Every single nuclear power plant has an NRC person who is in charge of the quote-unquote oversight that nuclear power plant, for those of you who listen to this show, more often than not know that there is no such thing as oversight by the NRC or for the NRC. Actually, if you take the word literally, it is true because oversight has two meanings. One is overseeing. The other one is overlooking, as in not seeing. So when they use the word oversight, that is both accurate and inaccurate, no matter which way you mean it. Exactly. So I had already known that there was a scram in March. A scram being? A scram is basically an emergency shutdown of a nuclear reactor. Something terrible has to happen for there to be a scram because when there is a scram, it insults 
every single mechanism put in place inside that nuclear power plant, meaning it causes undue harm to nuts and bolts, to wiring, to the fission process, to the cooling process and mechanics, all kinds of things. It creates a major technological insult to the entire plant. And then on top of it, it releases radiation. So a scram is a full unit stressor. It's kind of like you're at 100 miles per hour and then you screech on the brakes for this entire plant. And it has consequences no matter what the reason for the scram is, which has consequences of its own. But the scram itself does damage to the facility. Absolutely. On top of which, there are radiation leaks from the scram itself because, again, nuclear power, in in this case with boiling water reactors, is to create steam. And what do you do with that steam when you shut all systems down? It has to get out. Let's get back to the scram and continue with your explanation of what takes place during it and what we are facing after it. Well, one of the main things that happens during a scram is the plant has to be shut down because something terrible has happened and something needs to be fixed immediately. And in order for the fix to occur, everything has to be shut off. So what we do know is that on March 20th, we had a control rod replacing another control rod. Why? Well, apparently things weren't in balance. That's why you would need a different control rod. We know that there are pinhole leaks in the fuel rods from a bad uranium purchase that Energy Northwest did a few years back, thinking that they were saving money when, in fact, they were buying bad uranium from Paducah. And Paducah needed to close down. And so it gave this supposed very great deal on a price for uranium that Energy Northwest believed when, in fact, after doing the economics review, Robert McCulloch. Who is Robert McCulloch? Robert McCulloch is a renowned economist who loves to go into very large companies and break down for the people how that company is ripping off the people. He's done that with Enron. And he's now done it twice for the Columbia Generating Station. And he was the person who determined that this entire buy of the uranium from Paducah was a bad deal for the taxpayers of Washington, even though Energy Northwest told the taxpayers of Washington this was a great deal. They lied. They knew it and they lied. So the bad uranium, we believe, has caused pinhole leaks in the fuel rods. Now, a control rod is made to help create balance So in putting a new control rod in, was this to create stabilization for an unstable situation, which of course there was because there was a scram, to stop the leak? And what this person from the NRC who was in charge over there, Dan is his first name, Dan said to me, we needed to put the control rod in to stop the leak from getting larger. So he admitted that there was a leak. Yes, So that was March 20th. Now, on March 28th, an article came out from Annette Carey, who was a reporter for the Herald, the Tri-City Herald. And she reported on March 28th about the scram and said that the nuclear power plant had its first scram or unplanned shutdown in more than six years on Monday afternoon. At 1.30, the Columbia Generating Station's control room received an indication that a system used to cool equipment was not operable, said Mike Paoli, Energy Northwest spokesman. Again, Mike Paoli, he's the PR guy. The system uses water to provide cooling to pumps and heat exchangers in the plant, including the pumps used to recirculate the water used to control the power level of the reactor. Operators shut down the plant. Preliminary indications are that the issue was with a water system valve that was not in the appropriate position. So here we have a scram. Here we have more radiation being released. So I ask you, what is more probable here? Is it more probable that with Y102 leaking for four years, we've known about that it left the inner shell 
four years ago into the middle space, and now it's leaking through that, why would we think that with one graph from the EPA pointed to that leak at Y102? I can't even figure out why that would make any sense to anyone after hearing how much of this has been going on for four months at the Columbia Generating Station. What you are saying makes perfect sense. It's upsetting as all get out, but it makes perfect sense. And the question then becomes, how did the story become so widely disseminated that this entire incident goes back to the problem with the leaks at the tanks at Hanford, as opposed to any attention being paid to the problems at CGS? I think the first answer is that people have heard of, if they've heard of anything regarding nuclear waste, they've heard of Hanford. So Hanford is an easy get. You say Hanford, some people will already know what you're talking about. So why not just attribute it to Hanford? I think the second reason is that I can't think of anyone who knows more than a few of us regarding everything I've just said with how we track what is going on. There is a very small circle of us, maybe five of us. I'm honest about that. I know no one else who has tracked radiation readings, graphs from the EPA, events from the NRC, situations that are only told on the NRC Adams page, which is different from the events page, created spreadsheets, not just involving radiation leaks, but involving all kinds of trouble at nuclear power plants at the Columbia Generating Station specifically and across the United States, less specifically, and who have tracked surprise inspections with how many people are on drugs behind the control boards at nuclear power plants. Myself, along with about five others, do this. And when you are somebody from, let's just say, RT.com, and you receive a graph from the EPA at the same time that this story is out about Hanford, and the graph says Richland, because that's where the monitoring station is, Why wouldn't you just assume it's Hanford? So in other words, there's no separate monitoring between Hanford site and CGS. They're all under the same monitor. Exactly. Why should they make it any different? Radiation is radiation. Um, The EPA has never made it their responsibility to be transparent or tell the people what is real anyway. So this is just another wonderful way for them to continue on that particular path of lack of transparency and lies to the people, while at the same time, those of us who are interested in this dig deeply into the morass of, first of all, data, as well as an intentional misdirection that has been put forward by the NRC on its website and by the EPA, even more so on the EPA's website. And why do I say that? Because I've spoken to both. I've spoken to both. And when you talk to the EPA, I can guarantee you that most people you'll talk to there who you will be put in contact with by phone, if anyone, if they don't just hang up on you, will not know how to get through the EPA pages. We've had people in our small circle of, let's say, five who have figured that out. I'm not one of them. (laughs) I couldn't do it. I tried. I was lost. It was a maze I could not get through. The NRC pages are slightly different and a little bit easier. And in my case, if you ask the question just right, you can get somebody from the NRC who is in charge of your particular new plant or the new plant you're questioning to help you get through and find your way on the NRC page. So, Kudos for the NRC for something. In the meantime, I believe that what happened was, at least from what I saw, is that this RT writer, Alexa Vyarashevsky, took the graph and really got a lot of traction on RT.com with it. And it went out and people were like, wow, you know, there's a tank leaking. It's terrible, which it is. People are getting sick, which they are, which again is terrible and never should have happened never should continue to happen. And yet the whole time 
I believe, and I'm sticking to it, that it was all from the Columbia Generating Station. It's a very persuasive argument. So my question then becomes, we are talking on Monday, May 23rd, so this is very fresh information. What do we do about this? We know about the long-term leak at the Hanford site. Now there are spikes happening at CGS. Is this an emergency situation? Is this something that people can get involved in and do something about? I mean, other than having the bad news about this and being at the affect of the NRC and the EPA and CGS in Hanford, what's a person to do? There's not a lot we can do regarding Hanford. That doesn't mean that there's nothing we can do. What we have to do and what everyone has to do is contact the senators from the state of Washington and the senators in Oregon who think that they're off the hook because Oregon doesn't get to have a say, so to speak, on Hanford, even though Hanford affects all of us. And not just Oregon and Washington, by the way, and those separated by the Columbia River, but Hanford actually affects the entire Western Hemisphere. But wait a minute. There are state boundaries. There are country boundaries. You mean radiation doesn't respect them? Isn't that wild? Yeah. It goes to show on such a deep level how our borders and our boundaries and our walls are so unreal, based in in nothing when it comes down to energy right? Radiation is energy, and it's made from energy, a terrible source of energy. So back to what we can do regarding Hanford is use your own human energy to get on the phone and write letters and write emails and do not vote in these senators who refuse to create an outside independent oversight board for the cleanup of Hanford. That's what has never been done, and it's what's necessary. And the only way to make that happen is to get senators on board for that. Because, again, everybody, the senators, everybody gets part of that $2 billion. We don't. The people don't. That $2 billion every year at Hanford, where do you think that goes? It doesn't just go to Bechtel and the contractors. It also goes to election committees. And the nuclear lobby is massive. And part of the nuclear lobby, the reason that it's massive, is that money goes to the PR campaign to keep the nuclear industry on track. To continue the lies and to continue to protect their source of funds, they give a little bit of it to the PR campaign, and then they pay the trolls, they pay the false research departments, they fund the false science, quote, unquote, I don't even want to call it that. And do what they can to confuse the issue so people go, ah, I can't see it anyway. Why bother with it? Can't do anything about it. Why bother about it? That's right. And it even goes, as you were saying that, the PR goes into the so-called green environmental movement. And it infiltrates our movement for a cleaner world. And how it does that is it takes its own people who believe in nuclear power and who tell environmental leaders that nuclear power plants are carbon free, which is not true at all. It's 100% false. But they convince by having a PR team that is top notch, you can't get better than the nuclear PR team. The best soulless cubicle drone wordsmiths that money can buy. Yeah. And so what happens is I go to a Bernie Sanders rally with information in Washington about our nuclear power plant just to tell people that we have one and let them know because I'm thinking these people might be interested in that. And I get people telling me they had no idea we have a nuclear power plant. And I get other people telling me from the same community that we need to hold on to nuclear power because it's carbon free while we pull ourselves off of fossil fuels. That line comes directly from the PR machine of nuclear power, folks. That is not true. It's false. When you hear it, you'll know where it comes from. I understand that there are now two initiatives that have been put together by No Nukes Northwest. Tell us about them and tell us what we can do to support them. 
We created two state initiatives there for Washington State only, and the result for both is to shut down the Columbia Generating Station, and with one initiative, it is also to retrain workers to get them into alternative energies and train them so that they can move forward with their lives and not be out of work. So the initiatives are easy to find. You can go to radcast.org. And on the menu bar, you will see Washington State Initiatives to Shut Down CGS. And you just click on that. There's a letter for how they need to be printed with directions. And there's two documents. And you can just download them, send them to Kinko's. They're a weird size because that's how Washington makes us do it. And you can go and collect signatures for all of us in Washington State. I encourage you to do that. I hope that you'll find it in your hearts to do that. I hope for those of you who do care about any form of future, whether or not we have one. I understand that argument. I really do. But the fact is we're here right now. So while we're here right now, let's do something. Let's do something positive with ourselves and not freak out about nuclear power, not deny that there is nuclear power, not pretend that nuclear power is carbon free and green. Let's get real about it, collect signatures and stop creating more waste through the Columbia Generating Station so that we don't have more Hanfords out there. And let's shut this plant down. Mimi, you are always a source of energy and insight and information and ferocity. I love what you're doing. And please, as you continue your watch on the Pacific Northwest, both Hanford and CGS, do keep us informed here at Nuclear Hot Seed. Thank you so much for having me on. I really enjoyed this interview. So did I. That was Mimi German of Radcast. She can be reached through radcast.org and on the No Nukes Northwest page on Facebook. Note that when Mimi referred to Susanna Frame, she was citing the award-winning journalist of King 5 TV in Seattle, who is the only investigative reporter in the country assigned exclusively to a nuclear beat. She is also a former interviewee on Nuclear Hot Seat in episode number 220 from September 9 of 2015. And back to Mimi's interview. When she mentioned Paducah, source of the substandard uranium that was used at Columbia Generating Station, she was referring to the Paducah Gaseous Diffusion Plant, which produced enriched uranium for nuclear weapons and then reactors before being forced out of business. Activist shout-out! We reported last week on the sad news that Michael Marriott, executive director and then president of Nuclear Information and Resource Service, had passed away after a battle with prostate cancer. This triggered in our community an outpouring of love and testimonials as to what a great man, fine father, husband, and friend, kick-ass musician, and ultimately effective activist he was. It was both surprising and gratifying to me To see that his passing was noted in great detail and with many column inches in both the New York Times and the Washington Post. These publications do not always give the anti-nuclear movement the coverage we would like, but they did Michael honor and respect as they marked his passing. Too bad they couldn't have published more about him during his life. Now I have to ask, where's the book? that compiles Michael's many articles, blog posts, press releases, and advisories into a single handy guide to anti-nuclear activism. He got it right, and he made it clear. We need to preserve his voice and pass his wisdom on so it does not die with him. Anybody at Nears you want to discuss this? It's what I do for a living, and I can certainly guide you through the process. It would be my honor to do so. Here's today's final thought. As I've mentioned, Nuclear Hot Seat is coming up on its fifth anniversary show on June 14, just three weeks from now. Who'd have thunk it? I'm playing around with several features and formats to possibly use on the show, but I think it's time to ask you, what would you like to see reprised or covered or investigated on the anniversary show? 
Do you have a favorite moment? An anecdote? A story that you would like to hear repeated? How would you suggest I celebrate five years of effort in such a way that it will launch me on to the next... Well, let's not scare me and say the next five years of shows, but just the next one week at a time production of Nuclear Hot Seats. And what would you like to see covered in the coming shows, the coming year? I already have some great interviews in the pipeline with activists, authors, filmmakers, scientists, and more. People who are lining up to get on the show and give you the best possible verifiable information about nuclear issues. But things can always get better. So send me your best ideas. You can do so at info at nuclearhotseat.com. Just zip out an email to me. I'll take a look and see how what you write inspires me, guides me, and gives me clues as to how to make the anniversary show even better as we move into year six to infinity and beyond. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, May 24, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from the DenverChannel.com, DenverPost.com, Nuclear Energy Information Service, Beyond Nuclear, 12news.com, post-gazette.com, dailycaller.com, nbcnews.com, asahi.com, stars and stripes, peaceandplanet.org, gg press, nature.com, globalnews.ca, thestar.com, no nukes.nl, au.news.yahoo.com, CanadianDimension.com, TapCanada.org, ShanghaiDaily.com, DeUnRenard.wordpress.com, RT.com, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the wordsmiths who sold their souls to write PR manipulations for World Nuclear News, and the activist community of Nuclear Hot Seat, all of you terrific people who gather and post on our Facebook site, which you are all invited to visit and like if you have not done so already. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV, ActivateMedia.org, PlanetExperts.com, on NewZSentinel.com in New Zealand, StuWebRadioNetwork.com, and now broadcast over the FCC's airwaves on WGRN-FM in Columbus, Ohio. But we're always looking for other stations and networks to connect with. So if you know a news aggregator, a community radio station that would like to carry the show, put us in touch. You can check out our archive of over 255 shows on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com. On our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, courtesy Ms. Milky the Clown and Joni Ray, and on iTunes. If you sign up on the website for the free chapter from my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, you'll receive notice of Nuclear Hot Seat every week via email. The full book, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, is available on Amazon. And a reminder that your contributions help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force it is for honest, accurate nuclear news. So please, do what you can this week to help us out with the donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep, because we are all, every last one of us, in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. 
It's the bomb.